Hello and welcome to the Cinematic Attic YouTube channel. Uh, it's time once again to take a look at what I've picked up. But also, on this episode, of course, a couple more entries into the Pantheon. And, um, yeah, holy crap. Uh, <laughs> last episode, when I did a spotlight on uh, what I consider my own imaginary Warriors Cinematic Universe, uh, I did not expect it to become... Uh, something that I would need to update significantly immediately. So, a uh, special section on that at the end of the episode. But let's take a look at what I picked up recently. First of all, from Vinegar Syndrome, my favorite company. I only got two titles from their August releases. Um, first up, no brainer, absolutely had to get the next volume, volume 5 of Forgotten Jolly. These have been spectacular. These are the films you get inside, for those of you who may not have seen this already in 7,000 other YouTube videos. White Dress for Mary Ali. Uh, hoping I'm saying that right, I haven't seen the movie yet. Tropic of Cancer. And Nine Guests for a Crime. So looking forward to watching those as soon as possible. Also, picked up the release of The Birds 2, Land's End. A lot of people I heard say that they'd never heard of this movie, didn't know it existed. It was a TV film, made for TV film. Um, and I have seen it. It's alright from what I remember. But I got this mainly to upgrade this VHS I had of it, where I first watched it. Next up, uh, no no film noir box set from Kino this time, but I'm sure there will be next time. Instead, though, I have film noir from Imprint, the Essential Film Noir Collection Three. Um, this is uh, an Australian label and uh, a little bit more pricey than Kino's sets, um, but here you get four titles. Strange Love of Martha Ivers, which I've had on a budget release, I think a Mill Creek box for a long time, so nice to get a, a good release of that. Barbara Stanwyck film. Another Barbara Stanwyck film, No Man of Her Own. I've seen this one as well. Um, it's it's uh, a good one, but didn't own it. Uh, the Turning Point. And The Desperate Hours, which also upgrades this VHS for me, for this Humphrey Bogart film. So another great set from Imprint. I'm almost glad those don't come out as often as the Kinos because these are a bit more expensive. Next up, uh, some things I normally wouldn't maybe show in this portion of the uh, update but um, I'm going to anyway <laughs> I went to a uh, an antique mall to a, a dealer uh, dealers booth that I hadn't been to in quite a while he he they whoever it is always has um, blu-rays for really good prices like their typical blu-rays are three dollars um, and I wandered into the store the other week and there were a lot of uh, uh, discs that I needed to fill holes in my collection for some, you know, mainstream sequels and prequels and sidequels um, for really good prices. So that's what I did. So for $3 each, I got the third John Wick film. I got the Bumblebee Transformers film. Again, for $3, this uh, store exclusive, uh, maybe Target, I'm not sure, uh, of Hobbs and Shaw, the Fast and the Furious film. This actually coming with a booklet and everything. And then a couple that were not $3, but this is the last um, of the batch of 
uh, modern mainstream films that have been in my Amazon card forever just because I don't usually like to pay a lot of money for uh, these kind of films. I like to save my money for the older, more obscure stuff like uh, that. But um, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, the, um, the last major Star Wars film that came out, this is in 4K. This was only 10 bucks. This, I believe, was a Target exclusive. So, it is, if I don't drop this everywhere, four disc edition, and it also comes with a book. So, I finally knocked that off my list for 10 bucks. These are, these are items that I usually put on my Christmas list for people to buy for me. <laughs> but at those prices, could not say no. The last couple items I got there at the Antique Mall, well, this I think was also $10, but it's the uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon Legacy Collection, all three uh, creature films. So that was a nice find. This actually upgrades three VHS for me, but I'm keeping those tapes because um, they're collectible, at least for now. And the last one, another $3 Blu-ray, but the strangest find um, amongst these others, and that is a Japanese Blu-ray of Sam Peckinpah's Cross of Iron. Not something I expected to find <laughs> in the same booth, but very happy I did. Um, this upgrades a VHS for me. But uh, yeah, it's totally in Japanese. But of course the movie's not, so it doesn't make any difference. So happy to have that on Blu-ray. Last three items uh, that I'm gonna show all relate to, again, the Warriors Cinematic Universe. I'm hoping with this episode, uh, that's the last I'll have to, you know, really dig into that for quite some time. I don't wanna um, <laughs> keep, uh, keep going with that every episode. But these, um, I, I will talk about more at the end of the episode when I talk about uh, my WCU update. Um, the first, I got this, I watched this recently on a Mill Creek box. It was, of course, in full screen, so I had to upgrade that. But I loved the movie, The Sadist, from 1963. Um, this, you, if you go after this Blu-ray, you will find it under this title and cover art for Sweet Baby Charlie. Um, it's a code red disc and it is out of print. I did have to pay more than I wanted on eBay. But I, but it did have the uh, reversible cover art to the title I believe it's better known as. Um, but this is a great film. If you haven't seen this, it's suspenseful. It's amazing. Um, but I'll talk more about this at the end of the episode. Future Kill on DVD. Um, this and the last one I'm going to show uh, were recommended to me to watch to see if they might fit into the Warriors cinematic universe. Um, this is a German DVD. So again, everything on there is in German. But the movie's not, again, so it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so I had to import that one. Uh, it took about a month to get here. Uh, but Future Kill, I'll talk more about that later. And the last one, I actually got a VHS for once in a long time on purpose. <laughs> Not something someone just gave to me or something I found for free. Um, long time viewers of this channel will know that um, for most of my life I collected VHS like crazy. I love VHS, still love VHS. But at some point um, I made the decision that I wanted to upgrade them for, if, if for no other reason, then I wanted to make sure I had all of the films the way they're supposed to be presented in their original aspect ratio. And of course, as you know, VHS, uh, the vast majority of them are pan and scan, full screen, chopped up versions of what was intended. So that was basically why I decided to upgrade. A few other small reasons, but 
That's why I decided to upgrade my VHS to uh, disc if possible. But if a film is not available on disc, I will by all means get the VHS, as I did with this one. Chains. Another one recommended to me to check out to see if it uh, fit the criteria for Warrior Cinematic Universe. This is Chains territory. There's only one way in and no way out. So, <laughs> again, I'll talk more about this uh, at the end of the episode. But until then, we have a Pantheon segment, and here's everything else I picked up. Through Amazon, I got these Region 2 discs. I was given a couple free VHS. And boy, oh boy, am I so glad that I can now have a successful aquarium. Grab this Blu-ray from Amazon because I discovered in my collection the dreaded full screen surprise. So getting rid of that for this. Went to a Goodwill, found a few things. Here I found another Fox Studio Classics, number 37, two for the road, and it will actually upgrade this VHS. Got these three DVDs from an antique mall to upgrade these three VHS. Got these three DVDs from a Goodwill, and they're all VHS upgrades. Went to an antique mall. And here's what I got from various sellers. Some of these are VHS upgrades. And this very interesting set from Spain with four, no, uh, five Lawrence Tierney films. Um, it's also a collectible, really nice booklet with it. It's all in Spanish, you can't read it, but um, that was an interesting find for a dollar. So these can be deleted. Got this DVD to upgrade this VHS. So this time around I got another two films to highlight, showcase for the uh, Cinematic Attic Pantheon, the list of my favorite films. And uh, the first one here is kind of a callback to the last episode. I had picked up the sequel documentary to this last time. Um, so I thought it was time to bring out the original story of film, An Odyssey, a documentary by Mark Cousins. Uh, this is a 15-part documentary looking at the history, essentially, but also the story of film uh, going uh, through the years. So this is basically about 15 hours long, but it is well worth it. This right here, um, if you're looking to get a crash course um, in the story of film, here you go. Uh, this I remember used to be on Netflix back in the day and that's where I originally watched it and I was happy that they eventually um, released it on DVD had to get it um, and I do remember um, back in the day reading the comments on Netflix all these people uh, complaining about you know they didn't like the narrator's voice or whatever you know these cynical entitled pieces of garbage that leave comments all over the internet um, but this is amazing ignore that these this is amazing this looks at film from all over the world uh, which a lot of documentaries don't so 
that's great but this this is this documentary is one of the first times I ever watched something that made me really really want to make films because it was so um, immersive and it brought out things that really brought attention to all the different artistic uh, aspects of film you can see here five discs um, one thing I love about this set though you know a lot of documentaries you watch and you want to grab a pen and paper and write down names of films because you know you want to see them with this one you don't have to this one and this booklet which not only tells you all about the making of it but in the back they go part by part and list all the film clips sources so all the movies that they talk about and show pieces from you got all these pages you got the list right here all you gotta do is grab the book and uh, if you're looking f to watch any of the films they talk about you got them listed right here so love that aspect of it but this is just an amazing documentary about film you know they talk about criterion being film school in a box this right here is definitely a film school in a box um, so I recommend this to anyone anyone at all who loves film if you haven't seen this check this out story of film and Odyssey second and this one will also <laughs> tie into the Warriors cinematic universe this is one that I've had in the, in the Pantheon for a long time and it just never occurred to me that it should be part of that uh, imaginary world I was I was dreaming up in my head and that is the John Carpenter classic Assault on Precinct 13 so obviously you probably heard of this this is a pretty well-known film it's a classic at least a John Carpenter classic if nothing else um, a uh, kind of reflection uh, of, of the old film Rio Bravo but it is the basic plot of it is you know a bunch of uh, well a small group of people under siege in a police station uh, and it's under siege by a street gang called Street Thunder yeah Street Thunder and it's you know under siege try to survive kind of film and um, so that ties in a lot to other films uh, that I talked about um, in the Warriors world um, but it also features a a street gang who's out for uh, to do no good they have you know um, a name Street Thunder you know uh, gangs and the Warriors all had themes and names and it just fits it fits uh, I believe in that world but more importantly as far as the Pantheon goes it's one of my favorite films I first saw this on this VHS which I have not gotten rid of because I love that cover art I love that logo I love that you have John Carpenter's name up there presented in that font I just love this this is a, an old cheapy an old UAV VHS but I got in a discount bin at a Dollar General a long time ago but that's where I first saw it um, and this is the uh, disc that I have the uh, image entertainment disc and I've never gone beyond this um, this is fine but Assault on Precinct 13 a classic film uh, classic action film classic uh, people under siege film so if you've never seen this what are you doing come on so today's inductees into the cinematic attic pantheon <laughs> So it's once again Warriors Cinematic Universe time <laughs> and at this point I hate saying Warriors Cinematic Universe 
It's such a mouthful. And I'm sure some people out there are sick of hearing about it. But hey, it's my video. What are you going to do? Stop watching? Oh well. So, The Warriors. Great movie, obviously. Talked about this before. In my head, I've always pictured a bunch of other films that could happen in the same universe. We talked about Enemy Territory. We talked about Siege. We talked about Tenement. We talked about Final Jeopardy. We talked about Certain Fury. We talked about Savage Streets. We talked about Survive the Night and Judgment Night. We talked about Assault on Precinct 13. And we've talked about 1990 The Bronx Warriors and Escape from the Bronx. Since the last episode, I've uh, checked out some films that were recommended to me that could also belong. I've checked, I've, I've watched a film that uh, I had no idea when I started uh, that I'd want to include. So I have three more to mention. But before I do that, I also wanted to say in the last episode when I talked about 1990 The Bronx Warriors and Escape from the Bronx, I realized I talked about them, you know, as, as you know, the post-apocalyptic future version or, or um, end result. Uh, I guess that's redundant. The result <laughs> of uh, the Warrior Cinematic Universe, uh, what the world would become, as if it were far, far in the future. You know, this whole thing. And uh, it's right there in front of me, 1990. <laughs> The Bronx Warriors. So this can't be, uh, you know, unless you want to ignore the year that's presented in the title and in the film and, you know, place it further in the future. Because obviously when this was made, 1990 was in the future. Um, but, you know, if you want to ignore that and place it farther in the future and just ignore the year, I guess you could do that. But if you took the year as gospel, as it were, and fixed that as the actual year for this film, and then I think Escape from the Bronx is 2000, then um, you'd kind of have to adjust some of the things I talked about. Because, for example, this movie, Judgment Night, I believe came out in the 90s, and I think Survive the Night also, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, it's probably easier just to say that, you know, even though these came out in the 90s, they didn't maybe happen. Well, then you could always push them back a few years into the past. Probably easier just to imagine that if you wanted to keep the timeline as everything went to crap <laughs> around the year 1990 or shortly before. I don't know. Anyway, just wanted to point that out for anyone who might have caught that. But some of the films that I just watched, uh, especially one of them, kind of form a connecting tissue from from the other films to these post-apocalyptic uh, uh, movies like Future Kill. This is um, another film that is like Judgment Night and Survive the Night in that you have people who are stuck in an urban area with street gangs after them, trying to kill them. But in this one you have a futuristic character that looks you know he looks a little um like a post-apocalyptic character that guy right there if you can see him you know he has like a robot looking helmet and armor <laughs> so he looks like something that might appear in these movies so i find that to be interesting as kind of some connecting tissue between you know the earlier movies like the warriors itself and these so I think that's kind of cool. So yeah, it fits. And it also has the same theme of people stuck in um, you know, a city with people after them, as many of these movies do. Um, now, the original Warriors did not have that as a theme specifically, but it did have, um, uh, as, as the main uh, plot of the movie, a group of characters who are being pursued through urban areas with people trying to kill them. So it still kind of fits, right? Right. 
So future kill, yeah, that works. The other one, chains. Here again, we have um, two suburban couples who find themselves stuck in an urban environment where street gangs rule and uh, they get caught up with uh, some things that are happening and people are chasing them trying to kill them so it is very much like this and many of the other films it's it's even like this in that regard um, this one actually has uh, some I think some frat pledges who get <laughs> caught in the city uh, with people trying to kill them so these all relate um, so I found that to be really cool really fascinating um, and I did not you know I'm starting to realize that this was kind of a whole subgenre more films with that plot than I knew so yeah chains definitely would fit it's a bit more of a low-budget affair as is this but still works and uh, the last one was the one I discovered. Now this one um, kind of opens up the door. Now if you say that, you know, 1990 or thereabouts is kind of where things start going post-apocalyptic off the rails and um, movies, most movies after this wouldn't be eligible unless they were set in the past. Um, then it, it still opens the door for uh, thousands and thousands of films that happened prior. And so I started thinking to myself, well, gee, um, how many older films could you say might be part of the same world that might have elements that relate or lead to um, things that could take place in this same universe? And with that, um, you could go nuts. So I tried not to go nuts. <laughs> I, could, I could be uh, inducting hundreds of films into this cinematic universe if I were to really run wild with that. But I did find one, I did stumble upon one and watch it in this past month that I felt very strongly um, could fit. And of course, The Sadist, which I mentioned earlier, this one has a similar plot where you have these three friends, uh, these three teachers who are driving to a uh, baseball game um, who get off track. They're, they have car trouble. They um, pull into this uh, area where they think they can, you know, get uh, some help. Um, so they, you know, much like this because these guys are on the way to some kind of um, a, an event a boxing match um, and they get off track and get in trouble same thing happens to these folks they wander into this place that's in the middle of nowhere and you know at first you think um, it's gonna be you know somewhat of a mystery as to what happened to everybody but you soon realize hey there's a crazy man who uh, killed everyone no, no real spoiler there uh, that was uh, in this remote spot and now these folks are in trouble because he and his psycho girlfriend are after them and holding them hostage and, and doing all sorts of uh, evil and sadistic things so it has very much uh, in spirit uh, a connection to these other films in that regard I I almost see the main character in this movie or I should say the main bad guy in this movie as kind of a uh, an early um, representation of the kinds of characters you would see in the later movies you know you kind of almost feel like if, if the um, the urban gang violence that um, puts a lot of these characters in these other movies in peril were to have kind of a, a birth spot a um, you know an early a representative 1963 it's almost like this is the guy who started it all almost I'm not saying that you know officially just 
you know, it kind of gives you that vibe. Like here's here's where those kind of um, sadistic attitudes began, where people started, uh, you know, becoming those kind of characters, and then also the characters who become victims to those folks. So it's it's uh, fascinating in that regard, and it's an excellent movie. It's a great movie, suspenseful to the end, and it it. it it does not deliver all of the uh, the things you might expect. In other words, don't think you know how this is going to end. <laughs> um, it's great. But it kind of, for me, right now at least, is a starting point for the Warrior Cinematic Universe. It's like, Let's start with this film, and then, you know, if we had a timeline, you kind of have this as an early a precursor, you know, almost a foreshadowing kind of a movie, and uh, that I love. So, this is, <laughs> this is my update. We are now um, 15 movies in this family of, of films, this universe of the Warriors, and that's kind of cool. Even though at this point, I really need to take a break from it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that'll do it for this episode. Um, I hope that was interesting. If not, what are you going to do? Anyway, until next time, everyone. Enjoy your movies. <laughs>